Um, but to give you a, a brief talk overview, I'm going to talk about the context behind this project that I'm going to present, um, the analysis with scenarios, and then some perspective on the whole system. So context, uh, about 10 years ago, I worked with John Duxbury on a whole farm greenhouse gas emission inventory. Um, uh, I'm going to talk about the GWP, or the global warming potential of methane and nitrous oxide, just to get everybody on board on what that means. And then the results of our Hatch Research Grant on greenhouse gas mitigation on dairy farms. So with John Duxbury, um, we looked at the major farm greenhouse gases, methane, nitrous oxide, and carbon dioxide. And we found that looking at the combination of the crops and the dairy systems, right, so producing the crops, importing the crops, making the crops, and producing the milk, 34% of the greenhouse gases was from feed production. And of that, three quarters of that was from the energy used in that feed production. 38% of the greenhouse gases were from enteric emissions, and 23% was from manure management. Okay, so this is kind of the starting point. We're looking at this section of the whole farm system. That's what I'll be talking about in terms of thinking about proportion. So, so manure management 101. Larger farms have more manure, so there's more land application, so there's probably more impacts to water quality. So there's probably going to be instituted um, more manure storage, right? One pound of manure applied to one area of land is going to have the same difference. So I don't mean to make a distinction between small and large farms, right? Like, but what I'm trying to get at is larger farms are probably going to have manure storage. And what happens when you move away from a more aerobic system like we have had traditionally in the state, such as daily spread, it's very aerobic and there's no methane produced. But if you move to manure storage, right, it becomes more aerobic, less oxygen. So it's like recreating the belly of the, of the cow out in the field. So all of those bacteria that are in the cow's gut that make the enteric emissions are now out in your field producing those emissions, but now in your manure management system. What's the problem with this? Well, methane, CH4, is a powerful greenhouse gas. So you've all, we've all been hearing about this today, but I feel like there's a need for some clarity on this. So GWP is the global warming potential. It's a relative measure of how much heat a greenhouse gas traps in the atmosphere. It compares this amount of heat trapped to carbon dioxide, okay? So the greenhouse, the global warming potential of carbon dioxide is one, so it's the comparative unit, all right? And we use CO2 equivalents in order to compare these different gases, right? So that's important. The most recent IPCC report shows that on a 100-year time span, the global warming potential of methane is 34. You've been hearing 21, 23, 25, okay? There's institutional reasons, those are old numbers, okay? But I'm gonna be presenting today with this number, and this is important later on. But what also is important is what we heard from Frank, right? The environmentalists were talking about this 70 times more potent. Well, that's if you consider on a 20-year time scale, okay? So, uh, and I'm just, you know, nitrous oxide is like 300. So you've been hearing about these different numbers. The most recent IPC report is 34. And these are based on several things. The ability of the molecule to trap the heat in the atmosphere. The infrared, infrared wavelength that it traps. And the lifespan of that molecule in the atmosphere. So the ability to heat has to do with the physical structure of the molecule. So hold the heat the infrared wavelengths that it traps. If you've got a lot of one molecule and it traps a lot of one wavelength, then maybe you've got more molecules than you have wavelengths. So, right, does that sort of make sense? If you have more molecules than you have wavelengths to absorb, it's sort of, all right, I see one nod. <laughs> and the lifespan in the atmosphere. How long does this molecule last in the um, atmosphere? 
So this is important. Methane lasts 12.4 years in the atmosphere. Nitrous oxide, 121 years. SF6, 3,200 years. All right? Now we're all making decisions in society. Cornell has SF6 usage here for some of the research, and they have to account for it because it's important to this research project that is happening here. Society makes decisions to use certain molecules, right? And the point here is, you know, farms produce greenhouse gases, but they're not the only ones in this, this impact to the atmosphere, okay? So I'm just sort of contextualizing it. So on the 100-year time model, it's 34 times, methane is 34 times as potent as carbon dioxide. On a 20-year, it's 86, but over 500 years, it's seven. Okay? Methane is important. It's a powerful greenhouse gas. All right. That said, while methane and nitrous oxide are more powerful in terms of retaining heat, in terms of quantity and impact overall, most of the greenhouse gas impact is from CO2. So again, keep this in perspective. Methane is powerful and thereby provides an opportunity for mitigation because we can just flare it, all right? I cannot suck back in my own carbon dioxide and miraculously photosynthesize it, sadly, <laughs> though I think I'd be a very innovative girl if I could. <laughs> um, so including these greenhouse, this global warming potential, right? CO2 is 80% of that problem, 80% of our societal problem, and that is a fossil fuel predominantly based problem, all right? So even though I'm coming here talking to you about how you can mitigate it on farm, keep in perspective, this is an opportunity, this is not, you know, this is not the sole responsibility of dairy. Um, and I've said this before, it's a powerful greenhouse gas, but it's easily combusted to carbon dioxide, and it's a resource if captured for energy. So um, as for the grant that funded this project, Peter Woodbury and I wrote a Hatch USDA proposal um, because we recognized farm size was increasing, the logistics of larger farms, best management practices, CAFO rules are foreseeing more manure storage to protect water quality. We know that anaerobic storage um, increases the methane production of manure. So how do policies that improve water quality impact greenhouse gas emissions from dairy farms? That's sort of where we started from. And is there a cost effective way for addressing these new greenhouse gas emissions? So we're moving into the second part of the talk which is the analysis with scenarios. So this is just showing that the, the blue dots are smaller than 200 cows. You all know this, right? These are the much larger farms. The 500 is green and the 1,000 is black, right? There are more and more larger farms. There are fewer and fewer smaller farms. So there's a transition in how manure is being managed. So in addition to that, the total number of cows is going down, right? Um, and the number of farms with more than 200 cows is going up. We've projected this into the future, right? The data goes to here, and then we've projected these numbers of farms that are large in the future. And then we said, we made an assumption that uh, farms larger than 200 had manure storage, okay? And that's how we got this stored manure total, This progression based on the size of the farms. And then um, uh, we did the uh, percentage for stored as a liquid. And uh, we have one data point, uh, well, Karen Kettering did a survey recently and 61%, uh, 62% of farms greater than 200 have six months storage. and. Um, from a survey done by the EPA, but based in New York State, uh, it showed that 20% liquid manure was in 1992. Okay, so I'm just showing you those two ends of our assumption. Farms larger than 200 have storage. Okay, when you, um, so 
there's nitrogen and there are volatile solids in the manure. And nitrogen in the manure leads to production of nitrous oxide, which is 300 times as potent of a greenhouse gas, while the volatile solids in the manure leads to the production of methane. So we use the EPA calculations to estimate the greenhouse gas emissions from dairy farms in 1992 and 2012. And this is, these are the results. Um, so these are the nitrogen emissions Right, and these are the methane emissions. These are the nitrogen emissions of the methane, okay? But what you can see here is that in the broad stroke in 1992, the total emissions were 702 uh, metric, 702,000 metric tons per year. Oops, additional information is needed. How do I get this down? Well, I'll just tell you the number is 1.5 million, right? So from 1992 to present, right, we have doubled our emissions in New York State. Meanwhile, if you remember, I told you earlier, we have reduced our herd size significantly, okay? Um, and you'll also note that the nitrogen emissions are relatively small relative to the methane emissions in both scenarios. So 80% of manure management emissions are from anaerobic storage, um, which is causing more methane. But you'll see that the proportion of the nitrogen is still small. But the pie is getting bigger, right? The pie of total emissions from the farms. The 1992 herd on the left, the 2012 herd on the right. Now let's think about that, right? In the, if if the herd in 1982 was uh, 1,400,000 and the herd in 2012 was 1,200,000, if we take the 2012 herd and we apply the methane emissions from the 1992 manure management strategy, the methane emissions are only 473, right? What does this mean? In 1992, we were doing mostly daily spread it's aerobic. It's not producing the methane. So, what the point here is, is that we have fewer cows. And had we continued daily spreading, you, New York State dairy would have reduced emissions in New York State. But because we moved to improving water quality, because that move was liquid storage, because liquid storage is anaerobic, we have increased significantly the amount of methane emission. All right? So the efficiency in the dairy industry is actually beneficial. Had this not happened, had this herd size not gone down, this number right here would be much higher, the existing number. OK? Is everybody getting that? Am I? OK. So the increases in the dairy efficiency have reduced the methane potential. The 2012 herd produced 14% more milk with 15% fewer animals. And so effectively, the 2012 herd reduced the methane production potential. You guys, it's, you're doing well, right? But because we have moved to anaerobic storage, the total emissions are now greater, okay? So we then saw Environmental Credit Corp's pilot project in New York State um, it was funded to retrofit cover manure storages on five dairy farms in New York. And then we used three, to f three of these five farms to do our analysis because only three had good data, okay? That's indication, that's information, okay? So here are the three farms, farm one, farm two, farm three. These are the months January to December. The big production months are June to November, right? It's warm. The bugs are happy, they're producing, right? These stover, uh, covered storages, right, they're not being heated. You're not actively trying to produce the methane. So the methane really is being produced in the warm months. Um, but this also affects the efficiency of the flare to destroy that methane, right? In the winter months, when it's got a low concentration of methane, you're, you're not getting enough methane to combust. And the flare isn't working for various reasons. 
but in the summer months, the flare is working very well, okay? Um, so, but overall, it's, it's like 80%. The flare is working about 80%. So, if we take and conglomerate all that data down, you have farm one, farm two, farm three over here. The destruction efficiency of the methane on these farms was 81%, and the methane conversion factor was 0.61. All right, that is the conversion of the vol to solids in the manure into methane. So 61% of the vol to solids in this manure is converting into methane in these averaged across these fa three farms. So I'm just repeating. The MCF is 0.61. The destruction efficiency is 81%. The flare can be nearly 100%. But the conditions have to be right in order for it to be at 100%. And that seasonally, it produces more in the summer. So what I need to make clear here, because this methane conversion factor is very important in terms of your greenhouse gas accounting, if you're going to apply this without calculating on a per farm basis. In our scenario, we do solid separation. All right, we separate out the solids. That means 50% of the volta solids in the total manure moves to the solid section. So EPA has different MCFs for different kinds of manure storage. So the liquid slurry storage is 0.24, that's the MCF, right? And for um, uh, the liquid, the MCF, oh, it's done up here. The MCF of the anaerobic lagoon category is 0.68. Big difference, right? If you're going to say that 24% of the volatile solids is turning into methane versus 68%. But what you have to remember is that we've separated out the solids in our liquid scenario here, and we're just taking 61%. Remember, our methane conversion factor was 0.61. We're just taking 61% of 50% of the volatile solids. I don't know, maybe this is nuanced, but if anybody wants to talk to me more about the methane conversion factor, it's important. Uh, we can talk about it afterwards, but it's important because if you're going to get penalized for how much you're producing, do you want the high or the low methane conversion factor? That's a question I'm asking. Hmm. <coughs> you want the low one, the low one yeah. if you're going to be penalized. If you're getting carbon credits, <laughs> what do you want, people? <laughs> the high one. The high one. What do we want for society? The right one. True. The right one. <laughs> <laughs> all right. See, we're all on board here. All right. So, here's our scenario. What if manure storage, manure storage was covered and equipped with a flare? So you have all been hearing about anaerobic digesters and producing energy and destroying the methane by producing the energy. Step back. All we're talking about here is you got a pile of manure. It's got a lot of volatile solids. It's very anaerobic. Let's put on a cap and address the greenhouse gases by putting on this cap and putting a flare, capturing all that methane and destroying it. Okay? You're turning the carbon from a factor of one carbon dioxide, into methane, a factor of 34, depending on which one you use, combusting it and returning it back to one, okay? That's what's happening here. So we have two scenarios, a large cover and a medium cover, and this was our, our sort of middle ground, but you could see that you could have a longer storage with fewer cows, right? The shorter storage with more cows. But our ideal range was 1,000 cow milking cows, or a 550 milking cow farm. So that's what large and medium means. Um, in the Environmental Credit Court, they uh, have these costs for equipment, personnel, blah, 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 right? For the one, this was averaged for the farms that were roughly 1,000 cows. And then we just did a ratio to size it down to the volume for a 550 cow, okay? Then what we did was <clears throat> we added the cost of a separator to separate the solids out so that only the liquids were going into this storage unit. And the idea there is that you don't want to have to keep removing the solids every year, 
right? Because that's going to leak and there's going to be all these problems. So only the liquids are going in, so that's why we have the separator and that's the cost. We also added a cost for disposing of the cover. And then we added a savings over 10 years from reduced water hauling, right? Because you've now covered your storage and the water is just flowing off the side. It's no longer going in to your manure catchment. And then we added interest at four and a half. So a large cover would cost 380,000 and a small co or medium sized cover would be 270,000. Cost per milking cow is $38. Cost per metric ton of CO2 equivalents is roughly 10. Okay? So, notably, we do not give financial benefit for optimizing spring end application because that happens with the storage. That does not happen with the cover. Uh, you know, some analyses give credit for the nitrogen that's kept in the liquid, but that happens when you have just the storage. You don't need to have the cover. But this is a great greenhouse gas mitigation strategy, but that's not included. That savings is not included in our cost, right? That's a decision that happens when you make a storage unit. So then we applied, I'm, I, I think this is less important, but we applied um, a 2017 and 22 scenario. In the 2017 scenario, there would be 375 covers installed, and in the 2022 scenario, there would be 662 covers installed in the state. And that would result, that would cost $133 million in 2017 and $224 million um, in 2022. Um, uh, and uh, mitigate 70% uh, of the methane emissions from the stored manure in the state. Um, just to sort of encapsulate the whole sequence of events here, right? These were the 1992 emissions when we were predominantly da uh, daily spreading, okay? Right? The green is the nitrous oxide emission factor, and um, this uh, light peach color is uh, from the liquid slurry storage. This is the 20, 2012 scenario, right? We have more liquid slurry storage, right? So you've got more of this methane coming. If we continued business as usual, this is what the emission would be in 2012. But if we covered in our scenario of 662 covers, I think I said, this is what would be eliminated by being flared, right? This would be... Um, from our factors that is not effectively being um, flared through various things along the process, this would be the emission, and then this would be the total. So it'd be in between the 1992 and the 2012 total emissions. So the price was between 10 and 18 dollars, depending on you know if you're doing the large farm, which is more cost effective, and the smaller farms, on average. Um, so this price planning is dependent on the methane conversion factor, right? Because if you're converting more or less, you're flaring more or less. Um, this price impacts farm and policy planning. Um, I've already said it, the MCFs make a difference. Um, so at our MCF of 0.61 and only, you know, addressing the liquid portion, 50% of the manure, with an 81% flare effectiveness and a global warming potential of 34 and a lifespan of the cover of 10 years, all of these things alter the price. But like Art said in the beginning, it's a model and it's a reasonable model, right? And you can change these numbers and play it out for yourself, right? But we do feel like this is a good ballpark. The current prices, right? We've all heard Reggie is at broke $5. The California market is at 13 for allowances, 10 for offsets. And I calculated um, uh, from Ag Methane, what's his name? Patrick. Patrick. I calculated from Patrick after you remove all of the other associated costs from using his system, um, seven to nine dollars, whether you were the smaller or the larger farm that he was dealing with, right? Meanwhile, the social cost of carbon was between 12 has been estimated between 12 and 129 dollars right the social cost of carbon being you know flooding disasters farm crop 
problems, right? So this estimate that we've given you here is at the low end of the social cost, and it's within the range of current markets, you know, um, it's within the range. I am not saying this is going to make your farm money. I'm saying this is a cost-effective way of addressing greenhouse gas emissions on dairy farms. I'm going to skip this because I don't think that's important. So summary. Farm size is increasing. Larger farms mean more manure storage. More manure storage generally means more anaerobic conditions. More um, anaerobic conditions, that's a typo, equals more methane produced. Methane is a powerful greenhouse gas, but we can eliminate its potency by capture and flare. And for perspective, this is a series of good and bad. <laughs> U.S. dairy farms have reduced emissions through efficiency. That's fantastic. And manure storage is protecting water quality. That is fantastic. Bad methane is a powerful greenhouse gas. The manure storage concentrates the methane all in one place so that you can capture and flare it. It also helps retain the nitrogen for spring application. Bad. On a 20-year lifespan, it's 86 times as potent of a greenhouse gas as CO2. On a 100-year lifespan, it's 34 times as potent. And on a 500-year lifespan, it's seven times as potent. It's an important greenhouse gas. Good. Methane is easily combustible, and it is a fuel resource. Bad. <laughs> Collecting a gas is doable, but it costs money. Generating electricity is doable, but as you've heard many times, it costs money. Good. The social cost of carbon dioxide is 12 to $129 per metric ton. We're in that range. The CARB is selling credits at 10 to 13, and after you went through your your intermediary, it would be seven to nine, so it's kind of getting close. Possibly good, possibly bad. So if you flared methane today, and if methane is 86 times more potent of a greenhouse gas on a 20-year time scale, it re realizes a greater slowing of the rate of warming, right? It lives for 12 years. You could do nothing. It will destroy itself in 12 years but its impact will last 500 years. That said, if you destroy it now, you destroy it now. It doesn't matter which factor you use. If you use the seven, the 86, the 34, that becomes a financial consideration if you use the seven, the 86, the 34. You get it off your conscience. You've taken care of it. Um, yeah. However, you know, there's some realities. There's a cost benefit. This is basically going to cost two cents per gallon of milk. For me, as a milk buyer, and I build, buy lots of milk, that means nothing. But we all know that policies are keeping milk prices stable. Cost borne by the farmer, and it's not by the consumer. But it does control odor, it excludes rainwater, it reduces hauling costs, and if climate change does cause extreme weather events, it also prevents, you know, permit violations from overflowing um, open containers, right? However, it's not regulated and it's still entirely voluntary. And what I want to sort of do here is recognize that there are sort of four interweaving issues that are happening. There's the water quality issue, right? And I was talking to Carl the other day, yesterday, and he says it's about two cents per gallon of manure to make a storage. So that's 80,000. I'm telling you it's going to cost $370,000 to put this cover and do all of that business, right? So that's nine cents per gallon of manure. Meanwhile, renewable energy, meaning an anaerobic digester, is one to two million dollars. But then you also have to think about the farm viability. What is affordable? What can keep the farms going, right? So I think it's important that we recognize that there's four really different issues going on. Water quality, greenhouse gases, you know, energy self-sufficiency, and farm viability. And let's not, let's not sort of use them at cross purposes, but recognize when a farm might choose two that they want to focus on. Okay, I'm just going to skip this. 
and I'm gonna skip this. If I were to give three of my top things that a farm could do to mitigate greenhouse gases, it would be improve feed efficiency, and you're gonna hear more from Larry about that. Actually, you've all done pretty great on that already. I mean, this is more of a developing country, but it's always still important, which also impacts the nitrogen in the feed, which impacts the nitrous oxide emissions. Then also the timely nitrogen management. This saves money. And then if you want to spend some money, methane capture and destruction. Those are the three low-hanging fruit. The first two save money. The third is a really proactive and most effective thing in my personal experience of how to move greenhouse gas mitigation forward. And of course, there are different ways to skin the cat. If, you'd be, if you were doing deli spread, you'd really have no methane concerns, you'd just have water quality concerns. If you do liquid storage, you're gonna have water benefits, but now you're gonna have methane emissions. If you have anaerobic digesters, you've got water benefits, greenhouse gas benefits, energy benefits, but you got something that's really expensive. But like Doug Young said, there is a concept, that's me, I'm presenting a concept. And then there is the reality of implementing. And I am really on board here, people. I am an advocate for manure covers. I just heard one of your manure covers just exploded last week and has a hole and no longer is working. So. Like popped. Popped. Didn't oh, sorry, popped, popped. <laughs> My point here is I'm an advocate for manure covers. So if you've got some issues with manure covers, or considerations, please talk to me because I don't want to be advocating ridiculously bad stuff, right? I want us all to work together on mitigating climate change and so like, talk to me. I am a concept person, I am not a farmer. Mm -hmm. I like mm -hmm. farms, mm -hmm. I want to work with farms. I think climate change is really important, okay? And there's a whole slew of people who've helped all along the way. Um, but my last comment, I'm not really going to diss on digesters, though they're really expensive. Um, but you should just know that the greenhouse gas benefit from a digester comes predominantly from destroying the methane, not from displacing the fossil fuel-based electricity. All right? When you have an anaerobic digester, you have methane destruction, and you've got displacing grid electricity. It's only 4% of your greenhouse gas mitigation comes from the electricity generation. 96% of your mitigation comes from destroying the methane, okay? So when you're thinking about anaerobic digesters, it's about energy self-sufficiency, right? It's about destroying methane, but the, the greenhouse gas benefit from the alternative energy is relatively small. Does everybody kind of get that? Well, we can talk about it later, but. Okay. Thank you, Jen. Ah. We have a lot to cover in a hurry. Uh, we've got time for one quick question. Well, he's queuing up the next presentation.